Few writers can be said to dominate an entire century the way T.S. Eliot dominated the 20th century. Born in the late 19th century in St. Louis, he became a high priest of elevated culture and high culture uh, in, the, in England and the European continent by the end of his life in the, in the 60s. A huge, towering figure as a poet, as a critic, uh, as a publisher, uh, as a promoter and a disdainer of, uh, of poets from the very beginning through his contemporaries. A great uh, literary brawler, in a sense, uh, snidely <laughs> passing judgment on, uh, on figures revered and, uh, and not so revered throughout the, uh, throughout the English corpus. He was quite the character. His uh, his his childhood was uh, was exceptional in that he was a he was born in St. Louis. Uh, he went to prep school in New England. He graduated from Harvard College, did some doctoral work in Oxford, and traveled widely throughout the European continent uh, in that run-up to an interregnum of the, uh, the World Wars. He, uh, he's a curious, curious figure. What is most significant about him, we have to come back to, is, uh, is the work itself. And that was at once revolutionary and reactionary. He was a man of great contrast in all respects, and his poetry bore that out. The, uh, the, the totality of it landed almost immediately. Uh, he presented himself to the world at a very young age, in his early 20s, really, uh, a, a, as a kind of completed figure. He continued to evolve throughout his life, but that, that confidence, that authorial uh, majesty of his voice was there from the very beginning. Uh, always a little fussy, always a little uh, snobbish. Uh, he was never a particularly passionate or wild uh, uh, young man. When he came to the world, he was wearing a bowler hat and a uh, and a necktie. Uh, that is a a curiosity about him, and you can see that in his work. The first poem that we have from him of any real significance, uh, really the first major poem of his life. Uh, was is is called the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, a, a a very funny title. It's a, it has its funny moments as a poem as well. Uh, obviously, the love song of makes you immediately go on. It's like, oh, this is going to be some soaring emotional journey. And then you get J. Alfred Prufrock, a very stuffy sounding name. So you get that contrast automatically. And that gives up an awful lot of the artistic project of this poem. That sense of combating influences, uh, combating voices within the poem. The, uh, the soaring and the emotional and the romantic, if you will, and the kind of prosaic, dull, uh, quotidian world of a figure who would be named J. Alfred Prufrock. <laughs> <laughs> you can't help but love the name. I'm sorry. It's very, very funny. And from the from the start, he is working in a mode that becomes the uh, the, the gestalt of the 20th century: high modernism. Uh, this sense of uh, culture in the West has come to a point of crisis. Uh, culture in the West has uh, begun to break down because there is so much of it and we are all being crushed underneath it, the good, the bad, the ugly. And he is trying to recreate something from a long-standing tradition, but build something up out of that rubble. 
and this reaches uh, probably its apex in his uh, in his magnum opus, the the wasteland. But it is evident in Prufrock as well as a kind of an early uh, an early experiment with that theme, but one that is perhaps a little bit more uh, accessible to the general reader. He had to teach the world how to read. T.S. Eliot. Uh, it's very kind of him to do so. But the uh, the poem itself is uh, is uh, fantastic in just about every regard, quite frankly. He's, he's a charmer, and this is where he's more charming than most of his other stuff, which does tend, in when he becomes more established, does tend to be a little more ponderous, a little more Baroque, uh, a little bit more uh, self-consciously difficult and occasionally, yes, mean. Uh, here, a lot of that is, you could find little bits of it here and there, but it is, uh, more, uh, suppressed, I would say. It's not as prominent. So here you can sort of follow along while it still retains the essence of what is a T.S. Eliot high modernist poem. And for that, uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's terrific. It begins with a quotation from Dante, uh, from an example from, I think it's book 27, Canto 27 of the, uh, the Inferno, where uh, the, the, pilgrimage Dante, uh, the pilgrim Dante uh, comes across a figure from Italy, uh, another one, uh, and is begging him to hear his story. Uh, Dante is begging to hear this story of, uh, you know, why are you here? And the figure uh, is hesitant. Uh, he's a political figure, and he's not sure if he can, uh, if, if he can, or if he wants to tell his story because uh, uh, he doesn't want it to really get out. He's ashamed. That is a key thing, shame, and he is, um, he relents saying, you know, because you're here with me now, you are not going to, uh, by definition, be able to get out of hell, so uh, I can confide in you. I would not want to if I thought that the ugliness of my situation, the shame of my situation would get back. And that notion of uh, secrecy, of repression, of shame, uh, of something dirty inside that you don't want to admit to publicly, to society, uh, that is uh, a, a central element of the poem throughout. And he begins with it in Italian, T.S. Eliot does. He quotes the original Italian text, fluent in Italian, master of many languages. Uh, and uh, But right there, you can see him taking on not only quoting you know, a, a, a revered figure for, uh, for Eliot. Dante was Eliot's North Star in many regards, but also a core figure in, uh, in, in Western culture, in European culture, that represents uh, a kind of cultural high point that he, Eliot, is now experiencing as the tail end of like the it has been a falling off from Dante so there are all these ambiguities already just in the selection of what he's starting with this little quotation a little uh, a little tossed on uh, uh, call out to a great revered master of the past here it's taking on more and more meaning in that relationship. And this is not addressed explicitly in the poem itself, but it's part of the point that he trusts the reader or uh, relies upon the reader at least to distinguish for him or herself. There is in this a great snobbery again, a great expectation, a uh, I will leave it up to you to appreciate me. I'm going to just speak 
you know, uh, on my own level. I'm not going to talk down to you, but at the same time, I'm not going to make it particularly accessible to you either. I'm going to continue to speak as I would regardless of how well educated you are and uh, I don't care if I leave you behind. There's that relationship too. Anyway, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, forgive my Italian butchery. Uh, si io credesse che mia riposte fosse a persone che mai tornasse al mondo, questo fiamo storie senza più scosse. Ma per ciò che giama di questo fondo non torno vivo alcun, si odo il vero senza temo d'enfamia ti rispondo. Let us go then, you and I, when the, e when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through the certain half-deserted streets the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licks, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingering upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a, go made a sudden leap, and, sud and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house, and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides across along the street, rubbing its back upon the wi window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred dis indecisions and a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounted firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say how, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how shall I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that were braceleted and white and bare but in the lamplight drowned with light brown hair. Is it perfume from your dress that makes me so digress, arms that lie along a table or wrap around a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and walked the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully 
smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me? Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown sightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it toward some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it, after all? Would it have been worth while, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say what I mean! But as if magic lanterns threw the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worth while if one settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown, blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers by the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. Ah, uh, hmm. Very uh, odd, let's say. Very uh, curious. It's a, uh, a remarkable example of modernist poetry, quite frankly. And what that means here is I, you got to up your game. You have to step up to provide what, uh, what past poets would often do for you. The essence of modernism, as we can see in the painting of, let's say, a Picasso or something like that, is that you uh, can't assume everything that would normally be spoon-fed you. You need to make something of uh, the material at hand yourself. The poem does not tell you how to feel about it, doesn't tell you how to react to it, doesn't tell you what it means. It provides sharply, uh, sh sharply fragmented evidence that you then have to assemble together in your mind uh, into some form of sense. This is uh, this is obviously. A, uh, a a metaphor for the universe at large, for it's living in a complicated modern world where you cannot have all of the comforts of past generations for whom the world made sense. But in this modern mechanized world, we are all 
uh, struggling for significance in a uh, in an alienated um, universe, one where you cannot be certain of uh, meaning, significance, order, uh, God. Quite frankly, the uh, the notions that are summoned by this. Uh, come as a result of the form. It is a very fragmented form. You get chunks and images and individual lines with really no connecting tissue between it. Uh, a, a poet like Tennyson would have lines similar in this, not quite this, but similar, but he would guide you from point A to point B so that you could then get from B into C would be the uh, would be the line and he would just guide you along every step of the way. Eliot does not do that. Eliot just gives you these un, uh, undigested chunks of text that you then have to make some sense of. And he does not make it easy because so many of them, uh, so many of these lines have so much going on and so many different echoes and resonances and callbacks and quotations and references of all kinds that uh, lead you off in all these other directions. That becomes a spider web, a matrix of meaning that you are caught in the middle of trying to make sense of one bit at a time. And that simple sequencing of one thing at a time is broken, is fragmented. You don't get that. You can't rely on it. And so you get all these different elements. You get the chunk of Italian in the beginning, uh, which you know, maybe you can translate on your own, maybe you can't. Uh, but then you go from that into that first stanza, which is very swooning, very romantic sounding. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the, against the sky, which is very soaring and romantic. But then that image, like a patient etherized upon a table, that is not romantic. That is, uh, that is a, a rather cold, analytical, scientific, uh, brutal image. It is also an image, however, of exploration. We are going to, like a patient etherized upon the table, that is somebody who's set for surgery, and he is going to perform surgery on the human condition, I guess you could say, in a broad, flabby sense. Uh, in another way, you could say it's on himself, but he's really not writing about himself in this. A, you, you don't want to go down a blind alley of thinking that Eliot is particularly autobiographical here. But he is writing about himself, perhaps, as a... Uh, he, he is writing a poetic voice in this, presumably J. Alfred Prufrock, who then engages in some self-analysis as a kind of uh, avatar of humanity writ large. Let us go then through half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. You notice that flowing sound is back. After that cold, hard slab of the patient, we're back in that flowing mode. So again, there, it, it's juxtaposition. It is these two elements that are jammed in one uh, against one another, these two different kinds of modes, the flowing and the cold and slabby and hard, and you're just getting browbeaten by this, trying to figure it out one line at a time. Uh, oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit, which is a nice little intro saying, okay, come on, let's go. And it, it, it takes on this sing-songy quality. Notice that rhyme scheme. It sounds almost like a fairy coming in a dream and saying, let us go to a magical land far, far away. And you're just sort of entranced by this. And that sing-song equality is, I think, again, uh, used deliberately. The sing-song equality might make you think that it is some 
uh, some fanciful, uh, you know, Arabian Nights almost uh, romanticism. But it is not. But that mode just ironizes the actual substance here. Or the substance ironizes the mode of the poetry. And you're caught in the middle trying to figure out, well, okay, what is being made fun of here? Or what is being, uh, what is the true subject of this poem? And then you get another sing-songy little line, in the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. Which comes out of nowhere. Uh, in the room, we, uh, room? What room? I didn't know we were in a room. Uh, we were just going somewhere. I presume we were going out, but suddenly we're in a room. I don't know what that is. Uh, the women come and go. Talking of Michelangelo. Again, very sing-songy, that simple rhyme. Uh, you get this, uh, this notion of you are in a, uh, a, a refined uh, environment. In the room, the women come and go. Talking of Michelangelo. Perhaps, I would assume relatively refined, upper class, aristocratic, whatever you want to call them, wealthy, uh, perhaps educated women who are talking about Michelangelo. Uh, just, you know, as, as a kind of uh, cultural touchstone. It is a callback to classical uh, or at least Renaissance culture here kind of commodified into being chit chat uh, among women and you can you can certainly slam Eliot for an awful lot of sexism and and uh, and misogyny uh, in, in this characterization that little pejorative you know the women come and go you can sort of hear that it's not necessarily there I'm not gonna say it's absolute but it is presumable that you could put that little spin on that word. No women come and go. But you can't necessarily pin that on Elliot here. Um, he has other problematic issues with everything that we don't need to go into. Uh, but that one little two line couplet, I guess, uh, in the room, the women come and go talking to Michelangelo just appears out of nowhere and then disappears. And we're back with the yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes. That, that curious repetition is not rhyming, it's literal repetition of the word window panes at the end of that line. And the, the, the curious similarity there, it kind of, uh, it, it seems oddly repetitious, like we're not making any progress. It's just repeating the same thing with a slight difference, maybe. And then that characterization of the smoke, it's so poetic and beautiful. Uh, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stands in, in drains, that let fall upon the back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. Here, uh, many critics have commented on this being, you know, Elliot, uh, a, a great lover of cats was uh, superimposing uh, cat behavior onto a, uh, a, 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 a whiff of smoke. Uh, that, that curious, tendrilous, snaking quality of smoke to get into lots of different crevices, perhaps, but also of cats to do largely the same thing. Uh, it, it's, it's a curious juxtaposition. What it means, I have no idea. I don't particularly even care, but it's a curious combination going on there. Again, kind of uh, the uh, a, a kind of odd juxtaposition between the animal cat and the um, I don't know what you would call smoke. What is smoke? I guess it's uh, it, it's a gas, maybe. I don't know. Um, but that that curious 
duality of these two elements being at once both things and independent at the at the same time and you're trying to deal with this symbol and say well is it is it is it a cat that's being likened to smoke or is it smoke that's being likened to a cat and what is the nature of the symbol anyway and does it ultimately matter and could I spend an, an entire lifetime nodding the or unknotting this curious puzzle in my head or uh, can I just take it as oh okay maybe some maybe some symbols don't mean that much after all maybe it's not important what the symbols mean maybe I just got to get on with it and indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street rubbing its back upon the window panes there will be time there will be time that repetition of there will be time there will be time It's a curious reference to time, 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 rep repeated again and again. And it's the repetition of the word time is itself ironic because time makes you think, uh, well, okay, uh, yeah, time's money. Let's move it. Let's move it. Let's move it. But, but the same line keeps coming up. Uh, which is the opposite of what you want to do. You want progress. When you know about time, you want progress. But there is no progress. There is only time. And the time just seems to be piling up, like the time of centuries of culture piling up upon Eliot and the modern men or modern artists at least generally and the ability to try and digest and organize and synthesize millennia of culture and have anything at all new to say that pressure is building there will be time there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. To prepare a face to meet the faces you meet. Again, perhaps a reference to women wearing makeup. Perhaps just the ability to put on a happy face to go out in society, in polite little drawing rooms where women come and go talking of Michelangelo. Uh, the idea of putting on a social exterior no matter what is going on on the interior. That is curious. And again, that same sort of rhyme and very regular beater that sounds colloquial but is remarkably uh, well structured here and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate the works and days of hands the works and days are uh, works and days is a poem by the uh, by the greek poet hesiod about farming for god's sakes uh but it is also about the uh, the existential concerns of the the ancient greeks so that notion of farming being crucial work uh for sustenance for existence uh, in the uh, in the ancient days, before the incrustations of culture, really, uh, as Eliot would define it, before then, works and days ironizes the rest of what's going on here again, because he is doing something rather silly. This person is the modern person who is, yeah, just preparing and getting dressed and ready and preparing a face to go into a, uh, a, a room and have perhaps afternoon tea with some other polite members of wealthy upper crust society and just chit chat about Michelangelo and whatever comes into your head. Uh, just polite, common, noise not digging through the earth to produce your uh to produce your livelihood and out of that comes culture here they're just forgetting about all of that hard work the foundation of it and they're just sort of chatting about culture itself and they're left with the surface culture and not any of the hard original work that went into the writing of works and days and those 
foundational uh, elements of our culture that uh, have, have lost touch with their existential realities. Uh, and then that line repeats, of course, in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. And again, you're stuck. Well, I just read that and uh, no progress and nothing new, nothing different. That's it. Uh, it. It takes on the role almost of a chorus in a pop song where it just sort of pops up again. Uh, oh, yeah, okay, here's the chorus. But that itself is a reminder that there, there's really nothing new here. We're just kind of going in circles. We're just retreading the same material again and again and again. <clears throat> and indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare, do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. Here he is as a young man in his early 20s. I don't think he was losing his hair just then. Uh, perhaps his hair got a little thinner as he got older, as it does with most of us. But he had hair until the, uh, you know, he was never a bald man. Uh, but the, here he is putting on this, again, this voice of this imaginary character of J. Alfred Prufrock, who is perhaps getting a little bit up in years, perhaps uh, past the age of, you know, the, uh, the promising young man. Uh, who would go into a room like this with ladies and be a uh, a little bit of a catch. Okay, you know, he's a promising young man, good marriage prospect. Uh, you know, the, those people don't stay on the market for terribly long. Uh, here, he's somebody who's, you know, a little bit older. Uh, he's perhaps letting his looks go a little, or at least his looks are going without him. Uh, his hair is thinning. He's, uh, he, he has been there for a long time. So you figure, all right, he hasn't been snatched up yet. So maybe he's not such a great prospect. My morning coat, my collar mounted firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin, very concerned with dress, the proper, uh, uniform of going into society like this. This, uh, this is all very silly stuff, ultimately. It's not particularly uh, interesting. It's not particularly uh, 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 meaningful. And so, but he is going through the motions of this, almost like, dare I say, uh, a sacrament in church for which he has no necess no necessarily uh faith or belief but he's going through the ritualistic practices of executing the motions without any real belief within it and that hollowness is part of the point they will say how but how his arms and legs are thin. He's kind of a gangly guy. Again, not, not a great catch. Uh, and, and, and that sense of uh, hesitation. Uh, do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there will be time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. So that idea of anything I do, I can, I, I'm going to second guess and probably take back in a minute. Or somebody else will second guess me and take that back in a minute. Do I dare even do anything? How do I do this? That hesitation, that stagnation, that inability to do anything like create fresh art in a world piled over with art that is way better than anything you can ever really hope to do, so why even try? That is crushing him, crushing him. And he just ponders this. He's stuck in this stasis. Uh, I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that Fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I'm formulated sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin? The scientific mode of that, pinned uh, as if he is being dissected, like being etherized on a table, let's say. Uh, he is a victim of a kind of scientific brutality. Uh, an age of scientific brutality when he just feels alienated. He feels no connection. He feels like he has been reduced to 
uh, the level of uh, a, a, a specimen, a dead specimen, perhaps a dead human specimen, a corpse, but it's all um, so cold and he can draw nothing from it. Shall I say I have gone at dusk through the narrow streets and watched the smokes that rises from the pipe of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? Dot, dot, dot. Again, you get that wandering, that imagining of something perhaps illicit, uh, perhaps sexual, uh, perhaps homosexual even. Men leaning out of windows in short shirt sleeves, uh, something a little bit crude. He is a very proper, well-dressed, uh, wealthy young man. So to be hanging out in a seedy alleyway somewhere um, where illicit things happen in the dark, uh, that's, uh, that's curious. But it's also, it, it, it also sounds Amid the luridness of it, there is something of the romance, the something of something mysterious and dangerous, that curious, almost voyeuristic tendency of anyone. But by identifying that then somewhat lurid nature of himself, that somewhat dark nature of himself, perhaps sexual nature of himself, and T.S. Eliot was a very repressed individual. Uh, he retreats from that, almost in shame, shame. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas, which is a great line. Uh, <laughs> if you're ever at a party and you're not sure what to say, just say that line. And people will be like, you know, uh, oh, they'll probably call the cops on you. But silent claws, a pair of silent claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. A, a, a figure so removed from humanity that it's barely even bestial. It's just, it, it, it's not even a, uh, it, it's not even a body. It's just claws something that is absolutely foreign if you've ever seen like you know uh, lobsters crawling over one another or crabs there's something bizarrely uh not even animalistic about it but just brutal and primitive on a uh, uh on an impossibly to imagine on an impossible to imagine level so that shame sort of comes back he recoils from that lurid romanticism of the uh the 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 back alley boys there um the narrow streets of lonely men in shirt sleeves and he wants to crush that element of himself by saying you know i should have just been something even more bestial you know I don't even deserve to be a human. This is all going on in the mind of J. Alfred Prufrock. He, he's, he's sitting in this room, trying to imagine reaching out and, you know, starting a conversation with a nice young lady, one that might lead to an actual relationship. And his mind starts to go in a dark place, and then he pulls it back in, and he can't quite express any of this because that ellipses is significant like everything else in this poem it is a fragment it is a jagged edge chunk of meaning that doesn't really land anywhere it doesn't really develop there is no development there is no time for development there is only these raw ends that collapse upon themselves. And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten the matter off with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it toward some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I tell you all, if one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, 
That is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. A little drama there, a little dialogue. Um, the, the, the passion of those lines that are just, you know, a long run-on sentence, essentially. It's really not run-on, but it's multi-clausal. It is this kind of building sentence to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question. And then he jets up into this, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, the biblical figure returning from the dead. He feels dead inside, and here he's imagining being this biblical figure, this biblical heroic figure, to come back and say, I am returned from the dead, and wait till I have, wait till you hear what I have to say. And he's imagining this uh, reanimation, uh, the, 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 this reincarnation after death of some great figure. And the reaction that he is imagining this woman to see in this languid little parlor uh, is just to, you know, fit him, adjust her pillow a little bit. And, huh? What? What? I don't get you. How do you break through that? How do you crack out of the loneliness to make contact with that? And, uh, and and in that, you get the biblical reference. You get to have squeezed the universe into a ball, which is a quote from a Marvel poem, uh, Andrew Marvel, uh, another great uh, uh, another great hero of uh, of Eliot's from the uh, the so-called metaphysical poets of the early seventeenth century, early eighteenth century. Yeah, uh, and the um, that that. That sense of he he has so much going on that's tormenting him, that is bubbling up, but he can't express it, or he cannot make contact with anybody else through it. It is just raw, like the poem itself. It's a fragment that nobody can understand. And so that's why he questions it. And would it have been worth it after all? He's spinning his tires. This, this, this line repeats just as much. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it, uh, would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets and the novels after the key tea and the teacups after the skirts that trail along the floor? Skirts that trail along the floor is an echo of the scuttling floors of the cro of of the, uh, the 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 crab or the lobster or the the claw. Laws. So right there, there's a little echo within the poem of an earlier line in the poem, but that sets up the contrast between this bizarre, gnarled creature down in the depths of the ocean and these bizarre, you know, smooth creatures just scurrying around the, the polished floors of these very nice uh, early 20th century homes. Uh, it's, it's just uh, an astounding image. But it's also, you know, more after all of this, after all of this, after all of this polite stuff, everything that comes with an afternoon tea service, all of the, the, the fancy stuff, all of the porcelain, all of the teacups, everything, the, uh, everything is just so simple and superficial and suffocating. It is crushing him. And that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet. I, I love that he goes to this. No, I am not Prince Hamlet. Meaning, uh, at once, I am not, uh, you know, I am not a, 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 a great stage actor. I'm not great at emoting. I cannot do a soliloquy that bears my soul to everybody else. Uh, life here is obviously characterized in Shakespearean terms as the drama, also words a stage. Eliot's relationship to Shakespeare is also complicated, but you get that sense of uh, he, J. Alfred Prufrock, is rejecting the idea of being that kind of figure, that heroic figure, that romantic figure, that dominating figure. He is not. He says, I am an attendant lord. I'm a 
background player. Don't look for me to be the main character in any story. I am not the hero. I'm a background player. I'm a supporting cast at best. And uh, nor was I meant to be. Uh, I can swell a progress. You know, I can just sort of stand there to make it look like on the stage you swell a progress. When the king comes in in uh, uh, on stage in Shakespeare, there are always lots of attendant lords following him. So you get the, you don't see any of the individuals. You just see, oh, he's coming in with a large group, an entourage, if you will. This is his royal court. And this just means in the aggregate that the king is very important. So he's followed by a lot of people. They are not individuals. They don't have any lines. They're just there. One that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt an easy an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence and a bit of tooth. This is all uh, characteristics of Shakespearean drama uh, characters here of scurrying around the uh, scurrying around the king. One thinks most notably perhaps of Polonius following around uh, uh, following around King Claudius. Uh, full of high sentence but a bit obtuse. That's that's Polonius. Uh, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. So here by referencing the drama, by referencing Shakespeare, particularly uh, J. Alfred Prufrock, the poetic voice here, is backing himself into an awareness that he has become a foolish character. He's not only not the hero, as he says very dramatically at the beginning of that paragraph, he sort of reduces spinning into this conclusion that he is a fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. <sighs> More sing-songy, resignation, age and senility are closing in. Think about that bald spot in his hair. He feels himself going down the drain. He cannot rise up like a hero would. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. More sing-songy, that cute little uh, um, uh, tripartite line. Uh, the, uh, simple repeated rhymes at the end. Do I dare to eat a peach? Uh, do I dare to... Uh, do I dare to enjoy nature? Uh, the peach has all sorts of associations that are sexual. Uh, do I dare? He is somebody very, very repressed here, and there is an imputation here of sexuality. Do I dare to eat a peach? Um, hmm. This questioning. Who is he questioning? Is he questioning himself? Is he questioning the universe? Is he questioning some god who would let all of this chaos happen? It's unanswered. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. He has heard or he has experienced beauty, but from the outside. He has perhaps heard uh, the mermaids Figures of uh, sexuality, yeah, uh, a singing, a, an, an act of, uh, of art, um, beauty. Uh, he, he has heard that, but from a distance. Uh, I've heard them singing to one another. I do not think that they will sing to me. That acknowledgement that that kind of joy, that kind of human experience is beyond you, that it's not for you at all. That conclusion that maybe you're going to be alone your entire life. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair, the white blown 
with the waves blown back, when the wind blows the water white and black, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. Very regular rhyme again. Uh, arguably sing-songy, but I think more melancholy now. Uh, it's... These artistic forms, these aesthetic forms, these uh, the, these flashes of music are just sort of washing over him like the waves at this point, and he can't stop it. And in a way, uh, it is washing him away. In those last lines, it becomes uh, almost entirely about... Ah, uh, these symbols that get churned up in the waves, but they don't necessarily have to mean anything. What matters is that they are just accumulating and pounding on him, washing over him again and again and again, until at the end, he drowns. He can't rise up above it. The art and the beauty and the missed opportunities uh, of life, uh, of art, of everything, have crushed him. And he is struggling to get out from underneath it. And that's the essence of T.S. Eliot's work as a whole. This desire to rise above um, these incoherent jumbles and find something more uh, authentic, more uh, more legitimate, uh, more inspiring. Now, for Eliot, he was uh, by nature a, 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 a cultural snob and, uh, and, and a fairly uh, reactionary one at that. He did not have a lot of patience for, uh, for uh, anything too modern, which he generally addressed as anything uh, that came about in the uh, 17 or 1800s. <laughs> um, not, a, uh, not a fan of the Romantic period, certainly. Uh, and he, uh, he, he found that, that mode of Romanticism, which so centered on the individual, that so celebrated the ego and the one heroic image, you know, not Prince Hamlet, uh, who was so revered in the uh, the Romantic era, that he re Eliot rejects the notion of romanticism. Eliot rejects the notion of one man being able to triumph and overcome everything. He is much more interested in submission quite frankly, the submission of the individuals within a broader tradition. And here you see this one figure stifled within, uh, stifled within himself with this erratic beating heart of an ego within him at war with the culture around him. The culture of uh, Georgian England of the early 20th century, where everybody is very polite, everybody is very well dressed, everybody goes through these little rituals and cultural sacraments of having high tea and behaving in a certain way, acting in a certain way, speaking in a certain way, relating to one another in a certain way. And he doesn't resolve this but he puts this question for us to deal with on our own. That conflict between this starving ego that can never really express anything with any truth or certainty um, at war with a culture around him that won't be able to understand that, won't be able to relate to that at all. So it asks the question, should you, as an individual, just sit there and 
drown your ego in the bathtub, so to speak? Should you swallow that down and just go through life without all of this highfalutin romantic fantasy? Is that all just a waste of time? Or is that the only thing that makes life worth living? The poem does not resolve any of this. The poem doesn't even try. It just presents these little chunks of evidence for us to wrestle with and creates the experience of being crushed by uh, the culture around us and all the quotations that you don't necessarily always spot. And it really helps to go through it with uh, very, uh, with considerable footnotes, but reading the footnotes ruins the effect of actually reading the poem. Uh, but without the footnotes, you don't know the, the references the poem is making. You can read through all of that and the references and the echoes and, 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 and the quotations all sort of go by you in a blur and maybe you're going to get them and maybe you won't, but you have a lingering sense, uh, sense that, well, that's an odd thing and what's he talking about? And all of that slowly builds up so that you are in that same position of, I don't know what to make of this. This is, this is too much. How can I exist in this world with so much piled high and I'm stuck underneath?